Well, gentlemen, well, it's six o'clock. We will go ahead and get started with uh, tonight's board workshop. We appreciate you all joining us um, tonight via, via Zoom here. Um, I think it's the right example to set for us to do this um, remotely. It's the safest way we can still conduct the district's business and, and uh, also help to ensure all of our safety and the safety of everybody else. So I appreciate it. Um, the first item on our workshop agenda is public comment. Because this workshop is a special meeting of the Board of Trustees, citizens may make comments only to the items posted on the agenda for this workshop. As allowed by Governor Abbott's temporary suspension of the provisions of the Texas Open Meetings Act, our workshop is being held through Zoom video conferencing. A quorum of the board is in attendance through video conferencing. Because the workshop is being held virtually, the format for public comment has been adjusted. In the official notice of this workshop, as well as on the district's website, anyone wanting to address the Board of Trustees on one of the workshop agenda items was invited to submit their comments through the public comment form on the district's website. No public comments were submitted, so we will now move on to the next item on our agenda. So tonight we have uh, three agenda items that, that we're gonna talk through. Um, our COVID-19 response, we're gonna have a quick update on the Oak Ridge High School master plan, and then um, we will get the latest version of our budget update from Mr. Rice. And um, so we'll get to that. Now, just talking about kind of our evening here, Zoom tips, there are things that we're learning tonight that will help us um, not only get through tonight's meeting, but the real focus will be for our meeting two weeks from tonight when we're going to have our board meeting, we're going to have to follow this same format. Um, you know, I know that many of you tried to upload your pictures and some of us it's worked and some haven't. Um, I think one of the tips that we've learned is not clicking on the link that Sarah sends necessarily, but logging into Zoom first and then putting in the numbers seems to help with those picture updates, but we'll have time to get that worked out. Um, because this is a workshop, we're not voting on anything tonight. So uh, we won't have that, but as we two weeks from now, we'll need to think about what this will look like as Mr. Williams is um, presiding over the meeting and you have items to vote on. And uh, President Williams, I think it'll be, you know, your, your choice, but we'll either need to do for everything that we vote on, we'll have to do a roll call or we'll have to switch where you all have your video on so that you can visibly vote um, yes or no when it's time to um, have items to vote on. But those are, those are things that we have time to work out um, moving forward. Um, the other thing I just want to mention to you today is you, if you've logged into your Conroe ISD email, you have seen today an, an email that has come from our Safe Schools program. That's the program where all of our teachers do their online training uh, during, the, during the school year or, or beginning of the school year. House Bill 3834 has mandated a, um, uh, a, a safe or a training for cybersecurity. And it's mandated for all employees of the school district, but it's also mandated for all board trustees. Your, the, the due date for trustees for that training is June 14th. So you have time here, but you have access now to, um, to that training. If you have any issues logging in, let me know. I'll, I'll be sending you some login information over the next few days as well. Uh, I believe that's a two hour training as required um, in, the, in the bill and uh, it, it's all online. So we'll have that for you as well. But if you have any questions about that, please just let me know. Um, and then tonight as we conduct the meeting, once again, you have, you have options. Um, one option would be to, to have your picture, your name up. So if you use the lower left-hand corner and you, um, put stop, stop video, that's what you'll have. If you want to be seen, you can hit share video and we will all be able to see you. If you're only seeing one person now and you'd like to see the group, uh, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, there should be a little Rubik's Cube looking item. You can click that, it'll take you to this kind of gallery view where you can see everybody that's in the meeting. Um, when you're not speaking or you don't wanna speak, you may wanna click mute. That's also in the lower left-hand corner. It's a little, looks like an old timey radio microphone. If you click that, then you'll be muted. Uh, and the biggest challenge, uh, it's nice to leave yourself on mute just so there's no feedback. The biggest challenge with mute is remembering to turn mute off when you 
when you do want to speak to the group. And if we don't have a, your picture, if you're not sharing video, we won't know you're trying to speak. Uh, sometimes when you're sharing video and you start speaking and you're muted, everybody in the group can say, hey, you're muted. We see you talking, but we don't hear you. So um, we want to share that. Any questions about the format um, or um, how to operate through Zoom before we um, get moving? We do have Sarah on the call and, and kind of leading this webinar um, electronically so she can help us. Or Sarah, is there anything that you would add uh, for the group? I think you covered it. Okay. Any questions? No questions? All right. Well, we will now shift to our first agenda item of the evening, which is our COVID-19 um, response update. We have worked hard to, um, you know, to try to update you along the way as to the different items that have been going on as requested in our last board meeting. Um, you know, if there were any changes through the, via the resolution that we made, you wanted to be made aware. Uh, we have made you aware that we are in essential operations mode at this point, and, and Dr. Hines will be discussing that um, soon. But that just means that we have limited personnel on campus and we are um, paying those folks that are on campus, if they're hourly employees, um, their emergency type wages. That's the only um, major provision that we have made a change of. You asked that I make sure to make you aware of any changes that we've had. Um, I will tell you, I don't want to take Dr. Hines' thunder because he's worked really hard on a, on a great presentation and it's thorough, um, but I could not be more proud of um, our people and in this situation. This is a hard time for our community. Um, I think that our staff and our campuses, as they do all the time, uh, have really been beacons of hope and beacons of light in the community. Um, the way that our teachers love our kids and love the families, it's, it's really... Uh, it's a beautiful thing, and I'm, I'm so proud of our team. And Chris is going to go through tonight um, every department and kind of what's been going on in each department, and then certainly we'll have opportunity to answer any questions that you may have about that. Uh, but this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chris, and uh, he will share his screen, and we'll see his PowerPoint. Thank you, Dr. Noll. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, in the we, as we shared, we're going to give you a little bit of an update on our uh, COVID-19 response. And as Dr. Noll shared, it's been um, very much a team effort. And we've been, uh, have a great and outstanding group that's been doing a lot. And different than past kind of emergency responses, um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see if it works. Um, Different than past responses, with uh, with this one, you know, with a hurricane, it's usually maintenance driven. This one has been interesting because this has been a response that involves many many departments, uh, but certainly some that have come to the forefront, such as uh, technology, communications, child nutrition, and our business operations side, and as well as our curriculum and instruction department. So uh, we want to just kind of walk you through uh, a little bit of uh, let's see if I can get on the PowerPoint of some of the things that have been happening since our closing of the physical operations of our schools in March. Uh, our priorities have been, and really I've just tried to summarize our five highest priorities. There have been multiple priorities, but certainly first and foremost, taking precautions to keep our staff and students safe so that we are reducing and delaying the spread of COVID-19. Our continuity of learning, providing nutrition and other supports to our students, communicating uh, with our entire learning community, and then our continuity of business operations. So these are things that certainly have um, risen to the forefront in the last uh, couple of weeks. We, uh, just to kind of back up, you know, we had spring break that week prior to the closing. We were closed the week of March 16th through the 20th. Uh, certainly there were some limited operations going on during that time, um, but that week really was a week of kind of trying to figure things out and uh, get a feel for where we were going. Uh, uh, on March the 23rd, we moved back into limited operations for that week. This involved a lot of planning, um, a lot of technology support, looking at getting materials out, uh, technology out, those kinds of things. Um, we adjusted our hours of operation to try to minimize contact. Uh, we've tried to limit the number of staff working on sites. Um, and then after that week, as we all know, things have, uh, the governor's, um, guidance has come out, our, certainly our own county's guidance. And so 
um, beginning in uh, March 30th, we went to essential operations, which really is very few people in our buildings. Uh, and really, uh, when they're there, they're there for a purpose. And um, one of our big purposes, of course, is food preparation. We're still in that, doing that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we have had regular and ongoing guidance and updates by Barbara Robertson, who has done a great job. She's our health services coordinator, and uh, she has certainly been a, um, a major resource for this district during this time. Um, we've operated a health information line with nurses that has been available from eight to three, just general, general calls and information. Uh, they can share resources that are readily available on the web, uh, but certainly it's an added resource for our community. Our health services has been involved with daily updates with the Texas Department of State Health Services, with uh, CDC. Um, there's been daily webinars with our district nurses. We've established protocols, uh, been developed for the food distribution process. And I have to say, everything's fluid. And we've been, certainly as we go, changing and, and learning. And, and uh, you know, I think when we you went to our food distribution, when we first started, we had, you know, 50 people out there handing out food. Today, you won't see that many, and you'll see them all spread out. So uh, certainly things have changed. Uh, we screen people going to work that day, take their temperature, and they have to fill out a questionnaire. So uh, there's a lot of practices that are in place to try to keep our sites safe. Um, they've been involved with uh, inventorying and distributing our uh, protective equipment. Um, again, I mentioned the health services call center. Um, we've collaborated with our the county's Office of Emergency Management, and we've even been involved with sharing some of our resources such as temporal thermometers uh, with the local fire and EMS departments. Shifting gears to food, one of our biggest operations has been our meal distribution. And uh, today, which I don't have the day's numbers, there were over 32,000 meals that, that went out just today um, for uh, Monday and uh, for Tuesday and Wednesday. And then we'll come back on Thursday and do Thursday, Friday and Monday meals. Uh, we have 10 sites that are being used, Austin Elementary, Caney Creek, Conroe High School, Knox, Junior High, Grand Oaks, Hawk, Oak Ridge High School, College Park, the Woodlands, and Washington Junior High. Um, we do give out two meals on Tuesday and three meals on Thursday. As of last Thursday, we have distributed uh, 205,868 total meals. And I mentioned today we did another 33,000 plus uh, meals, just to give you an idea. And they, the meal distribution has gradually increasing, and we expect that it will, uh, given uh, the economic situation going on right now. Um, Chris, this yes. is Scott Kidd. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Uh, I had an inquiry the other day by um, the individual who, uh, uh, what was the word, paid for the the lunch debt around Christmas time for a couple of our schools. Uh, and he was inquiring about uh, how we are doing on meals that are distributed. Is there some sort of, I guess one, is there a need for donations in that respect? And two, uh, what would be that need and how would that need be met? It's a great question. I know, and Darren may want to jump in on some of the cost issues, but uh, these are reimbursable meals that we're distributing. Uh, so there is a process that we're accounting for them and uh, we will be able to get reimbursed for the meals that we are distributing. Now, what, what happens during this time period, and, um, and Darren can add more, is certainly our child nutrition department isn't taking in as much revenue as they normally would take in because of the, um, they're selling and delivering other types of meals, but uh, but these meals would all fall into the category of reimbursable. And Darren, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Well, I'll jump in there, Chris. Um, we, we've had another uh, community member uh, that also came in and, and paid some debt uh, for students just a few weeks ago during the middle of this process. We've had multiple other family members or uh, community members reach out and want to know how they can help. Uh, like Chris said, these meals, they are reimbursable so that no one's amassing a, a, a debt problem with the meals that we're distributing now. Um, one of the things that I've shared with people, if, if you have people that are, are talking to you about what can they do, um, you know, I know the food bank is being hit hard uh, and, and they're providing for entire families. The, you know, the meals that we provide um, through these pickups are really just for the children for school days. So when you think about the whole family, you think about weekends, um, 
Montgomery County Food Bank is a great partner with us. So um, if somebody, if you are contacted by somebody that may want to make a donation, I would encourage them to consider the food bank. That's been a recommendation that we've made um, to other folks as well. I think at this point, um, that might be the most impactful place to make a donation. And, and the, the reimbursable uh, meals, that also extends to the, uh, the Meals on Wheels? The, the Meals on Wheels um, is really done through the um, food bank. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, uh, to, the, uh, to the homeless students, I didn't know. Uh, it, it, so to, to kind of dovetail what Curtis was saying, if someone wanted to, to donate uh, and they wanted it specifically to specifically go to CISD students, it, the, the food bank is an avenue by which not only are you helping some of the families overall, but you would be helping some of these uh, homeless students through the Meals on Wheels programs. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, absolutely. And the Buddy Backpack program, you know, that's the, the programs where they load up the backpacks um, and then they go home on the weekends for families over the weekends. The food bank um, handles most of those for us. Interfaith does a few, but the food bank does the, the majority. And um, that that's still functioning. So, you know, we, we're still... We're still coordinating that, um, you know, receiving those items from the food bank and distributing them to the families. So uh, I mean, if somebody wanted to make a donation to the food bank and specify they want to help the Buddy Backpack Program, or they want to help CISD families, or I think that would be the food bank could absolutely accommodate them uh, in that request. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And um, just, just piggybacking on that, we do have, um, we've also had our 12 communities and schools program that have sponsored mobile uh, pantries with the Montgomery County Food Bank. So there's been, in addition uh, to speak to your question, Mr. Kidd, uh, uh, some, some packaged uh, groceries delivered to families through uh, those 12 sites. Also Matthew's birthday wish is still continuing delivery to five campuses. And, and then as Dr. Noel mentioned, our, the County Food Bank is still continuing with the backpack program. So all of those are still in place and our counselors are certainly help, helping with that distribution. We also have uh, worked on staff and family supports. Um, I know we've shared uh, out to our schools and the counseling staff so they can share with families our, the list of community resources. Uh, we've reminded, and, and resources for our own staff as well, because I know many families, um, families of our students, families of our staff members are experiencing um, stress and um, you know, dealing with, with different challenges, whether it's job loss or health or um, other emergencies. And so, certainly trying to help um, support families. Um, we've, our counseling staff has been assisting with um, coping and talking to folks and they reach out on a regular basis and check on uh, families that they normally check on. Um, and we know that there's a lot of anxiety caused by this time of year because things are being changed, right? So people are looking forward to certain events and um, they've been canceled or postponed. And so that certainly is a source of more anxiety and stress. Um, in addition, our community outreach um, department has operated a Spanish hotline as well. So we want to make sure we're keeping those lines of communication open. And just an example of some things we put out. Uh, this went out about some some suggestions for staff about coping with stress and um, you know, and looking at trying to remind folks of ways we can manage that stress. In addition, we've reminded staff about we have an employee assistance program through our uh, through our benefits. Uh, for employees. Uh, another focus certainly has been continuity of learning. So being out for an extended period of time, we wanted to make sure that we keep our eye on um, student progress and preparing for next year. Um, and our curriculum department has been done a great job of stepping up and really looking and taking the curriculum and narrowing it to one or two essential standards for this, this last nine weeks. Um, there have been web pages developed for teacher and parent resources. Um, they went live on March the 20th. We've updated those weekly in English and Spanish. Uh, the plans do include standards that are being addressed as well as some suggested activities for teachers. Um, teachers have been given some sample video lessons and practice choices, some materials and notes. Um, and we're providing additional support for our students that are bilingual or ESL or GT enhancements for our students that are receiving uh, special education 504 and dyslexia services. As um, we're also providing a lot of support for our teachers with digital instruction. And so, um, you know, this has certainly been 
um, something that has tested our um, abilities to navigate technology. We're a wide continuum of skills, and so uh, it's gotten everybody's attention, and our learning curve has been steep, and people are learning. Uh, our, our Canvas, which is our learning management system, it's our LMS, is uh, all-time high usage. So um, there's uh, some things that have happened that are changes in the way that we teach and the way that we deliver instruction. Uh, this is just a page that is facing the parent resource web page. Um, it's been shared several times and there have been several uh, school districts throughout several states and even as far away as Hawaii that have contacted us to use some of those resources. Um, in addition, we have a, a web page where people can get specific uh, online lessons opportunities in the grade level. So we try to provide those materials online so that they're available. Uh, but having said that, our, our both our elementary and our secondary departments have been working uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks, really trying to, with an ongoing dialogue about this final grading period and trying to reduce stress and really um, come up with a plan that's fair um, and equitable. And uh, so there'll be an emphasis on student learning and feedback on reducing stress and providing support. And that's really what the focus is on this final fourth nine week grading period will be. Uh, there will be a focus on key objectives that address the skills necessary for success at the next grade level. Uh, it means we're going to put aside some of those other, um, you know, some of those other elements, essential elements. We're going to allow for students with varying degrees of support and remote access. Um, we're, we're not going to let that become a barrier for students. So our campuses have made um, great strides in either uh, delivering technology or, or paper packets to students. Uh, we will not. We will only limit to uh, one graded assignment per week during this this grading period while we are out, uh, and that that will be a formative assignment. So if students aren't doing well, they certainly will get feedback and an opportunity to improve it. Uh, there will not be penalties for late work. The grade for this last grading period will not be lower than the third nine weeks grade. It can be higher, so students can help themselves. They will not be able to hurt themselves in terms of their average. Uh, and, there, and there won't be any major grades or final exams in this fourth nine weeks. So um, a lot of changes that this is not by any stretch of the imagination, all of the points, but certainly I just wanted to get some of the highlights in case you had questions about grades and stress. And, and, and you know, I think these are the things that our schools are doing to try to reduce the stress, um, reduce the content down to just a few specific things, make it formative, uh, give feedback, give opportunity at the very end, um, no one's going to go down with their grade lower than what they had in the third nine weeks. Technology support has been tremendous as well. Um, this is been an area I mentioned our Canvas, which is our learning management system, is at an all-time high. Uh, we are using uh, what's in there; it's stored. So at some point, we may be required to have or maintain uh, auditable evidence that we were delivering instruction in order to be to receive funding for the attendance during this time period. So we certainly have been um, keeping records through our uh, LMS. Um, we also can deliver assignments. It's being used pretty much from high school down to intermediate school. Uh, we are at the other grades that aren't using the LMS. We are retaining some documentation or samples of student work so that we can show that students are engaged. We have um, our, our staff, our technology staff has responded to many, many calls from parents and teachers for asking for support. And so uh, certainly they've been very busy. A lot of those calls are being answered from their forwarding their calls to home, but they're certainly providing that support. We've uh, had uh, Chromebooks with internet service that's built in, 300 of those have gone out. We've also sent out another 500 hotspots. Uh, in addition, we had several already in place uh, prior to this emergency. Um, there have been over 4,000 Chromebooks that have been distributed to our students so far. And we've also been enrolling students during this time. So we've had 138 students that have uh, enrolled. Obviously, we're, we're not requiring families to come up and finalize the process. We're just doing it electronically, and we can finalize that uh, when we return to uh, a more normal operations. Um, and they are, uh, we have a process where families can either do it online or they can contact us and we will send them uh, the forms that they need to enroll. So that, that process continues. Uh, our application support teams have been working um, on supporting all those other business functions. We'll talk about a little bit more here shortly. We've increased our uh, internet bandwidth to anticipate much more dependence on that from uh, six gigs to 10. 
Uh, we've added internet redundancy, so we wanted to increase our protection from outages. Uh, we've had to we've had to go out and do some training a little bit because when folks are working from their home networks, they're outside of our firewall, and sometimes they're exposed to some risk. And we've had to remind people of that. Um, we've added some capacity to our single sign-on authentication, which uh, we added we started that about a year ago, and it's been a great resource so that staff members can easily log in and uh, gain inside the network applications from home. Um, in addition, our um, our web traffic. Um, is then therefore going outside of our network for most of the applications, which is a, a good thing. And then our single sign-on has allowed them uh, to work remotely and to be able to deal with some secure things. We've been able to increase our monitoring of our network systems and servers to prevent outages. Um, we've been using a lot of our cat, uh, staff that normally go out to campuses. Uh, they're helping with uh, call-in kind of troubleshooting. Um, we've communicated about applications that are available in Office 365 that, that, are, that is available to our students and our staff at home. So uh, we changed that about five or six years ago. So we have a, a district-wide license for all of our staff and students and they can access that from home. Um, we set up and assisted employees with configuring their office phones so they can be forwarded and answered remotely. Uh, we've created a process to notify our teachers when uh, students are enrolled because they're not seeing a new student come into their class. So we're emailing them. You have a new student, check your role. and Here's how you contact them. Uh, and then certainly we've had to increase the awareness of cyber cybersecurity issues for our employees that are now working from home. Our payroll department has been another one but under uh, uh, Becky Davis's leadership and they've done a great job. They're, they're um, have been supporting employees since March 16th. Um, they processed the April 1st uh, pay period uh, they're working on the next pay period, um, the April 15th one for full-time employees, long-term substitutes, uh, and regularly scheduled part-time staff. They have processed uh, manual checks when we've had some returns on direct deposits. They've processed salary information, deductions. Um, they've done research. They've stopped some student loan deductions, uh, and they've, um, you know, they've been notifying uh, staff members of some relief that's available now for uh, some loan. Uh, they've also processed WT, uh, WT requests and reprinting, um, TRS reporting forms. They're processing all kinds of reports uh, as well as the absences and the leave benefits and then responding to a lot of the inquiries and emails and telephone calls. Uh, a lot of calls about, am I gonna get paid? And some of those questions. Um, in addition, our finance, Purchasing, human resources, construction, all of our departments have been uh, working, you know, purchasing and still assisting with purchases. We've, we've added some hotspots. We've uh, ordered some technology. We've had to acquire some uh, help deliveries of food uh, as we move food from site to site. Our finance department has been working on, uh, we've worked on staffing projections as well as closing out travel and other events that have been canceled. Uh, and as, in addition, they're working on next year's budget. So there's a lot of work that's going on in finance, accounts payable, we're still paying the bills. Um, mentioned that our, our planning and construction department still moving and monitoring our, our ongoing projects as well as the ones that are starting up. Uh, the HR department's been very busy. Uh, again, we're completing all of our employment processes. We're in the process of recruiting, po managing the postings, dealing with resignations, retirements. Uh, we are ensuring that our part-time staff and long-term subs are being paid uh, they're working on the complications that have arisen with some people that were scheduled to take some certification tests and those tests were canceled, so they're working on that. Uh, they've been working on uh, our allocations um, and making sure we have everybody assigned somewhere and then updating our benefit information. And they're responding to a lot of leave questions during this time. So uh, they've been certainly very busy. Our custodial department is, as always, under uh, Marshall's uh, leadership, has been doing a great job. They've been opening our sites for food preparation. They're supporting uh, the deliveries. Uh, they've been e-misting or cleaning our uh, feeding sites on a regular basis, as well as uh, office areas. Um, they check our facilities uh, three times a week to make sure you don't have broken pipes or uh, things that are amiss. Um, they have been involved with moving some portables that are getting ready for some upcoming construction projects that we needed to move some portables to, to, to have for lay down sites or maybe for where we're going to add on to the building. Uh, they've been responding to emergencies. They're maintaining our mechanical systems, the water wells, the wastewater treatment plants, and then there's limited maintenance going on of our, of our grounds. 
Another department that's really been doing uh, a lot during this time, again, is, as I've said, it's kind of it's a different kind of emergency. So we've had technology has been super involved with Terry Ross and Terry McClarity's teams working hard and uh, Robin and her team with child, child nutrition, but uh, Sarah Blakelock and her team with communications has also been uh, very busy because people want to know. They want to know what's going on, what's happening. And so uh, we have been sending district status updates uh, through school messenger. Um, they've hosted, uh, we've hosted several Facebook live events with Dr. Noll and his guests and have one coming up. Um, there've been videos, there've been book readings, there've been some lessons, there've been the less life, the life lessons, three part series that is now being released. Um, we had a virtual choir, uh, released yesterday and, uh, already had 30,000 views in 12 hours. Um, they've been supporting with rescheduling some of these events that are being postponed, such as the job fair, the car show, uh, the foundation breakfast, the early childhood fair. Uh, we were going to do a groundbreaking, as you all are well aware, and that's been postponed. Um, so there are several events that have been going on, um, pub posting up um, our public service announcements, creating graphics, uh, advertising our meal distributions. Uh, they've been doing a great job, too, of getting our uh, communications translated and out in Spanish as well. Um, they've collaborated with uh, creating with our communications department. We've created a standard email address for each campus. So we did that early on uh, so that we could, you know, besides monitoring one phone line, monitor one email line uh, so people could inquire and send their questions that way. They've helped facilitate our Zoom conference calls. So uh, Sarah's been helping us get set up for that. And, um, and we, we were limited to everything on a phone call. Uh, but we were able to expand to a, a Zoom meeting now because we have the capacity to do more than 100 in the meeting. Um, we have been processing postage and delivery of uh, mail, which is a big thing. So we have to stay on top of our deliveries and our, and our mail. Um, there's been a new district answering message that's been put out. Uh, and we have been monitoring at all of our sites uh, during business hours of 8 to 3, uh, trying to monitor our, our voicemail and uh, email messages and get back folks. And then just a quick advertisement here. We have update number five coming up on Facebook Live with Dr. Noll on Monday, April the 13th at 6 p.m. And uh, those have been very popular um, and very well attended and viewed. So uh, certainly want to share that. That was a quick update. I, I know I zipped through a lot, but there's been a lot of great departments working uh, very hard and wanted to share some of the things they've been doing. Thank you, Dr. Hines. And I would, I would just, um, want to say thank you to all the departments, um, board members. We, what we're in here is a Zoom webinar, which means that if you're looking at your screen, you're seeing uh, just those of us that would typically be seated at the dais or at the presentation stand um, in a board meeting. But all of those, those normal, uh, the folks that are typically in our meetings, they are present in this meeting as well. They're just uh, they're as participants. And so um, we want to thank all those folks that work so hard in the departments to uh, get this work done. It's been really impressive and also uh, we say good evening to our uh, normal folks that that join us via uh, in the media that help us communicate uh, to our families. I think we have Jamie and uh, Shelby from the Chronicle and Andy from Community Impact that are joining us online tonight and we thank you for that and um, thanks to all our community members that may be watching this live or may catch it uh, in a video later. But uh, at this time, any board members, would, do you have any questions for Dr. Hines or, or for myself or any departments or any comments that you would like to make this evening about our uh, response? Dr. Hines, this is Ray Sanders. I just want to comment and say I thought your presentation was very thorough and complete, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Hines. We certainly appreciate um, that presentation. It was very thorough, and we appreciate that very much. So, uh, we'll hey, transition. Uh, Dr. Hines, Curtis, I did, I did, Dr. Noll, I did have one question. Go what ahead. is saving? I hate to term it as savings, but uh, as far as what are the expenses we are avoiding on the um, um, transportation that may help offset some of our costs? Well, the, the challenge there, and, and Darren can certainly join in if need be, but while we are being funded normally um, on our normal daily allocation, we are not receiving transportation funding at wow. this time. So we're, we're not, 
incurring the expenses of driving the buses, but we're also not receiving the funding for that. So there is not a, uh, there's not a savings that is being realized at this point uh, on the transportation side. Darren, would you like to um, add anything to that? Yeah, Dr. Noll, you're correct. Uh, you know, although we're, we're not seeing the overtime or the extra routes at bus drivers, we are not receiving the per mileage rate. You know, we get basically a, a flat dollar per mile. And, uh, you know, that adds up to about, you know, we're in the last quarter. It's going to be in the neighborhood of three to four million dollars less uh, transportation funding that we're going to receive, um, you know, from the state due to us not getting those miles. However, you know, we are still paying the bus drivers their standard hours. Understood. Thanks, guys. Thanks, gentlemen. Yes, sir. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and transition now to our second agenda item tonight. Um, this is the Oak Ridge High School Master Plan Update. And as you know, uh, as part of the uh, November bond package, we included what, what was to be a phase one for Oak Ridge High School uh, in their planning process as we um, work to update that campus. It is now our second oldest high school campus in Conroe ISD. Um, and with the work that's being done at Conroe High, when we complete that work, you know, we'll make Oak Ridge our oldest uh, high school campus. And, um, and so we, there is work to be done there. As part of this process, a majority of the money to be spent in that building um, during this phase one of this current bond package is um, primarily mechanical. So we'll be going in and doing a lot of updates mechanically, but when you do that, it does give you opportunity to move some walls and do some different things. Um, we were actually approached by the city of Shenandoah with an interesting conversation a, a few months back uh, of looking at that site uh, in, a, in a bigger picture, sort of taking a, a 30,000 foot view of that site rather than uh, focus solely in on um, just simply changing out mechanicals, but really trying to take a look at the site and doing a true master plan, which is similar to what we started, like we said, with Conroe High in the last bond package. And now we're seeing the completion. So when the city of Shenandoah came to us, when we started a conversation about the road at Oak Ridge High School that actually connects um, right through the middle of the campus, it kind of bisects the campus and um, causes not only some safety issues for us as we have the public traffic driving in between Oak Ridge 9 and the main campus during the day, but also uh, it's an inconvenience for the community. If you've ever driven through there, if you try to drive through there in the middle of the day, if you happen to come through at a class change, you could sit for 10 to 15 minutes before um, you could cross. So um, the idea of doing something with that road to, to not only benefit the school, but the community came up Mr. Foster and I met with them, and uh, we have Mr. Foster tonight to make a, a presentation of uh, an option that we see as a viable option. It will change a little bit of our, our scope on the job here uh, in phase one for Oak Ridge High School, but uh, it may well uh, suit us when you look out 10, 20 years from now at the long-term um, benefits that we could gain from this and the feasibility of living on that campus long term could really be improved. So Mr. Foster, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Null. I'm gonna get my screen shared. I hope everybody can hear me uh, well, uh, but you should see on your screen now a map of the Oak Ridge High School Senior High Campus. And I can't see anybody's video, so I'm going to assume you can see it. Uh, but as Dr. Null uh, described uh, in his introduction, we've been studying some of the opportunities inside the main building uh, to help increase mobility inside the building, make it more manageable from the uh, student management perspective. Um, so I'm going to try to orient you to the site. So Hauser Elementary is down towards the bottom of the screen. Oak Ridge ninth grade is to the left side of the screen. So the front door of Oak Ridge High School is currently uh, right where the little hand is, right above the word Oak Ridge School Road. When we were studying the mobility inside the campus, the idea of potentially moving the front door uh, became uh, pretty clear to create some Main Street views down through the middle of the campus. So we thought about we would move the door 
for this side. And then we had a meeting with uh, the city. Dr. Nolan and I had a meeting with the city of Shenandoah, and they brought this idea to us to bring the road around. And then since then, we've had several. I've had another meeting with the city, and we've been uh, had contact with the city, uh, county traffic engineer, and we've been talked to the chief of staff for precinct four. Uh, we haven't had a physical meeting with them due to our circumstances currently, but we've gotten some initial impressions that the county and the surrounding municipalities would be uh, pleased with this transition of the road around Oak Ridge Senior Campus rather than through Oak Ridge Senior Campus. Uh, so one important addition is in the top corner you see the two uh, thick red lines. Uh, what I'm hoping we can do is create an intersection. This would be Johnson Road as it exits to the top of the picture. And if we can make that intersection, that gives us a connection straight through to Tamina, straight through to Wood Forest Stadium from Oak Ridge High School. Um, so tonight we're really looking uh, for just a little bit of guidance to make sure we're headed in the right direction if this is a pathway uh, uh, proceeding that, uh, that would be supported uh, when we bring some of it to you guys uh, with more development. Uh, but the idea here is uh, from a budget perspective, uh, we would use some of the current budget to invest in this process. Uh, incorporate that into the phase that uh, where we will now begin uh, a master plan type program with Oak Ridge Senior High Campus. Thank you, Easy. So just to kind of summarize Easy's statement, um, you know, what this would do if we if we do choose to, to make this change, it will it will affect the budget somewhat. It doesn't mean we're going to go over the budget. It just means we would shift some things from phase one to phase two. Um, but we would uh, it would allow us to reimagine this site as we are master planning with the potential to either build across Oak Ridge School Road and connect the ninth grade campus to the main campus or at least provide a secured walkway that would would connect those two without the road crossing um, you know without having to deal with the road crossing so we're not asking for a vote tonight this is simply for feedback this evening if we were to move forward with something like this we, we would be bringing project information to you in the future to ask for a vote but we would um like to to uh hear any feedback that you may have i see mr moore i see you popped up is there yes i do have a question um as part of this negotiation with the city of shenandoah do we know if they are willing to deed us the full access rights to Oak Ridge School Road like Conroe did with Wilson Road so that we could completely shut it off from public traffic if we wanted to? Well, we've, we've been able to just barely start those conversations. Ultimately, the, the right of way is county. Uh, so we've been trying to get a face-to-face uh, a -face meeting, which sounds funny now, with uh, the Commissioner of Precinct 4. Uh, Precinct Four isn't quite aware that this is in their precinct because they believe it's in precinct three. Uh, but we've also had a sidebar conversation with precinct three to help push precinct four. Uh, but in theory, uh, there's no reason why they would not uh, allow us to take back over the right of way that comes through the middle of campus uh, from a mobility state to the county. Uh, just this one change, uh, as Dr. Noll uh, indicated. Uh, eliminates a great deal of inconvenience to people that need to travel through that corridor uh, on a regular basis. So there's, uh, we've had some optimism from the, the traffic engineer's office for the county, uh, but we're still driving through trying to get to a, a, a meeting with the precinct court commissioner to get their, get their buy-in and feedback before we can, and then ultimately I believe we'd have to go to the full commissioner for the Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't anticipate there being an issue. I mean, I think, as we talked about, there there are huge um, benefits for us in this, but for the community itself, there, that's a large benefit as well. So I I would anticipate that they would be on board. It's just um, we would have probably had all those meetings done already, and, and the process would have been uh, completed. But this you know this situation has caused us all to slow down a little bit. Um, but but uh, you know we we'll, we can continue to investigate it more and bring you more information. Uh, unless you you tell us you don't want us to investigate it, then that would we would slow down. But uh, Mr. Sanders, is there a question? Yes, Dr. Noel, I had a question. I just wanted to understand. So the the back corner, which I assume is the 
<clears throat> northeast corner there that Mr. Foster is referring to. Do yes. we own the entire track or do we still, would that still be something that we would have to use a portion of our funds to purchase that track? Well, that, that the, the very northeast corner is still not our property. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, there's several options around it. So, I mean, a uh, purchase of that property is absolutely required, uh, but it would make everything more efficient. So, we would, okay. we would, but we've got several options to explore before we get down that road completely. All right, thank you. Mr. Foster, uh, site plan wise, um, the, the, do we feel like sports fields would need to move? Uh, Baseball, softball would be able to stay, but would the track and football need to move, or what? What do we anticipate, or are we just too early to be able to to make any guesses on that? Well, right now it's too early. Uh, I had a we had a survey crew on site this week, finishing the finer details of locating everything that's out there exactly. Uh, but we do intend to bring you know a, several options to look at because if the if this is a direction we can go quite literally, we've got uh, almost an endless amount of things to talk about uh, to put things in the right place for the long-term life of Kansas. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Foster before we, um, we can turn Mr. Foster loose this evening? So we appreciate you being uh, on the call, Mr. Foster. Um, no all right, well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Okay, well, we will go ahead and transition then to our um, final agenda item tonight, which is uh, our budget overview from Mr. Rice. And I just make a few comments about the budget um, before Darren starts off this evening. Um, you know, we, we always have our, our focus points that we want to have with our budgets, and, and Darren will hit those highlights. But, you know, we want to maintain the best school system that we can while also um, giving the greatest financial value to our taxpayers as possible. And that's why we maintain such a low tax rate through your leadership as a board. Um, and, and you're going to see that tonight. We want to, we want to serve our, our families and students the best that we can moving forward by making key additions to our educational program, like, like full day pre-K. And those are significant investments and you'll see they do cost money, but we think that we can do these things, and what Darren will show you tonight, that we can do those things and lower the tax rate. Uh, that's, that's our anticipation. And Darren will share that. And I think that's important um, to be able to do, at, especially at this time, um, financially in, in our community. And so we're proud of that. The, the other point I want to make is your leadership board members has been uh, really impeccable um, throughout the years, but, but even here recently. Um, if you go back to this time last year as we were doing budget planning and uh, the state was, was really putting a lot of money into public education and we all appreciated it. And we, we did um, put a lot of that money into salaries as we were directed to by the state. And we gave um, you know, good salary adjustments to all of our employees and we were proud of that. At the same time, uh, we held back some money. We didn't spend it all last year. And you saw a lot of other school districts and there were, there were places out there that were giving larger salary increases than we gave last year. And um, some may have questioned that, but I would tell you that today, um, your leadership on that is absolutely spot on. I mean, um, we are in the position we are today because we were conservative last year and we made good choices and we didn't just run out and spend all that money last year because it was there, we were, we were wise. You're going to see the same thing in tonight's budget presentation. We know that if you you just look at the state of Texas's budget, oil prices are down, um, sales tax right now. Everybody's at home, nobody's spending money, so sales tax is going to be down. So when they come back to Austin, um, we just anticipate that the budget's going to get tighter and tighter. So we are already making some adjustments tonight to our budget um, to account for that and even though we are growing and we grew about 2000 students this year and we are anticipating 1500 uh, more next year and who knows it could be more um, where we are making additions, we're making additions with that knowledge that if we have to adjust in the future because of budget changes, we're still going to be nimble enough to do that. So that's been a real focus for us. So 
Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Darren and uh, he'll hit the highlights there of, of what I just spoke of. All right, thank you, Dr. Noll. I'm gonna share my screen here. Did it come up for everybody? Yes, it's good. All right. Well, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. Uh, it is my pleasure to present the second installment of the 2020-2021 preliminary budget. You know, and just to echo what uh, Dr. Knoll said, you know, based on the leadership of our, of our board, CISD is in very strong financial position. And like he said, we're very aware of the economic trends that are out there, you know, with the effects of COVID, uh, you know, on the potential state budget. And then the price of oil that, that, that continues to drop is around $20 a barrel today. And then also the risk that that might have with our uh, average daily attendance. However, we're not panicking. Um, we are monitoring the situation. And right now we're fluid with the budget, so we can still adjust our budget, you know, as we go through this process before we go to adoption. <clears throat> you know, we'll start taking a look at the major components that drive our budget, and uh, they begin with the 2020-2021 budget objectives. And we want to meet the needs for the 2021 school year. This year we're opening a uh, new junior high school, Stockton. Uh, we're opening 12th grade at Grand Oaks High School, and as Dr. Knoll said, we're anticipating 1,500 new students coming this next year. Um, we've also identified personnel allocation adjustments that is needed at the elementary and intermediate schools. And also, we want to be able to provide a general pay increase for our employees. Uh, I'm going to call these uh, more of a cost of living increase. Um, you know, at the end of March, annual inflation rate was at 2.3%. I know that might have changed with some of the economic uh, downturn. However, that is still a real factor. And then this year, we are going to realize some health insurance premium increases, and, and, and we will go over that later in the, in the presentation. Um, and also, we need to provide funding to meet the requirements uh, remaining in House Bill 3. Uh, as you're all aware, we decided to go full day pre-K district-wide this year. We still have the Reading Academy for K through 3. And then multiple of, uh, programs with the Selexia, CCMR, Special Ed, CTT, CTE, et cetera, we want to continue the funding of those programs. Uh, this chart represents the fund balance of the general fund over the past 12 years. We ended 2019 with a fund balance of $140 million. Uh, this past year, we actually transferred $32 million uh, to provide funding um, uh, $12 million of that went to technology to support the 2019 bond referendum. And then $20 million of that went to establish our capital maintenance fund. <clears throat> our fund balance analysis, as always, our objective is to maintain an unassigned fund balance of 20 to 25% of our annual budget. And that gives us approximately three months worth of expenses. Uh, our 2019-2020 budget was right at $550 million. Our unassigned fund balance at 831.19 was $134.7 million, which is 24.5% of the budget. And that takes us to $24.8 million over our low end target and $2.7 million under our high end target. So we're in good position fund balance wise. And also we are anticipating our fund balance to grow in our general fund by approximately $10 million this year based on the savings we did uh, in our budget last year. And our strong fund balance position provides options for the board moving forward, you know, in the wake of COVID-19 and the possible effects of, of the oil prices and what it may have on the economy. So we're strong with our fund balance. As always, we like to look at our, our tax rate and how we compare with the greater Houston area. As you can see, Conroe ISD down there on the right, we're the red column. Uh, we're the second lowest in the greater Houston area. Um, the dark blue columns are our are, are Montgomery County area school districts. Uh, the, light, uh, the light green column is our peer districts. And those peer districts are the one we not only compare to financially, but also academically. Um, taking into account only our peer districts, our tax rate of $1.23, it's 15 cents below our peer average tax rate, and we're four cents below the closest district to us, which is Fort Bend. As I stated last time, this is probably the single most important slide we have as it pertains to our general fund budget. 
um, with the introduction of House Bill 3 and the move to current year values, this is what generates our revenues and, and, and really our expenditures for our budget. Um, uh, for the upcoming 2020-2021 budget, we're using an enrollment increase of 1,500 students, uh, and that is for a total enrollment of 62,000, I mean 66,298 students. And once again, we're using 94.2% for our average daily attendance. And this is just a graphic representation of our enrollment trend showing our estimate all the way out to 66,298 uh, students. As you can see, that is a pretty linear uh, graph and, and you can almost count on those 1,500 students each year. Darren, if I could make a point here, uh, be okay, is th these last two slides are, are slides that um, they really highlight our, our future financial exposure. Uh, when you think about COVID-19 and the possibilities of budget changes occurring within the school district, um, we, and, and why the fund balance is important. I think um, certainly this situation has, has shown us why it's important that we are conservative with our money and we have it for these emergencies. But um, you know, we don't know exactly what will happen with um, our attendance next year. You know, we, we've had that linear growth over time, but we don't know if this situation will affect that or not. We still have to plan for our normal growth because we, we have to have teachers present. Um, and the same thing with our um, average daily attendance. You know, if, as this virus may continue for a year, if we come back to school, we may have students that are out for extended period of time. And hopefully, um, you know, parents will be a little more conservative about sending their children to school when they are sick. So we could see this, this uh, daily attendance tick down a point or two. That might be a normal occurrence, but that could have a budget impact on us. Uh, and that's why it's important to have that money in the fund balance so that if we did need it on the backside, we would have it available. So uh, I just wanted to kind of make that point. All right, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Now moving on to our certified property values. Um, our property values are estimated to grow at 5.5%, and this growth will add about $2 billion to our property values, uh, bringing our total values to $40.2 billion. Now one thing we must realize now with House Bill 3, the impact of funding is minimal in the general fund. Uh, however, this is the primary source of, of funding for our debt, our debt, our debt service fund. I have been in contact with the appraisal district um, and our values are trending right about five and a half percent. That is where we think we'll be. Uh, possibly could be, you know, four and a half, five and a half, somewhere in that range. So we feel pretty confident with that, uh, with that increase. Once again, I just want to talk to you all about uh, tax rate compression and, uh, you know, per House Bill 3, um, all districts will have their tax rate compressed so that the district's local tax collection only increased by two and a half percent year over year. Uh, MCR stands for maximum compressed rate, and that is equal to the prior year's compressed rate times 1.025 divided by your local property value growth percentage. So for Conroe ISD for tax year 2020, assuming a five and a half value growth, you can see the calculation there, and that generates uh, a tax rate of 90.35 cents. <clears throat> now, I just want to take remind y'all that this calculation does not include the golden pennies. You know, at, currently we access four golden pennies. Um, and so let me just show you now what it'll look like uh, as far as a proposed tax rate. So if we look at the maintenance and operation tax rate for 2019-2020, our tax rate is currently 97 cents. Uh, we access four golden pennies. Uh, for 2020-2021, the legislature has given us the ability to access one additional golden penny. Uh, with adding that additional golden penny, our proposed tax rate for 2021 will be 95.35 cents, which will actually be a tax decrease of 1.65 cents, almost two total cents. Um, debt service tax rate uh, is proposed to remain the same at 26 cents, giving us a total tax rate of $1.2135, and you can see the decrease of 1.65 cents. So now that we've kind of discussed the major components that drive the budget, we will now look at uh, the effect that they have on the budget itself, starting with our 
2021 funding estimate, our tax revenue increase based off of 5.5% AV growth will generate 12.11 uh, million. Our state revenue increase based off of 1,500 student growth and accessing the, the golden penny will generate 10.8 million. Um, we're having this, uh, to decrease our investment income due to rates and the, the sharp fall and the cuts that the Fed has done by $1.7 million. Um, TRS in-kind funds, this is just an accounting entry that the state makes us add to our financials. Um, that is $3.5 million for total estimated available funding of $24.71 million. So now we'll look at the expenditure side of the budget. Um, this is our proposed 2020. 2021, and I'm going to call this a cost of living increase. Um, for our teachers, librarians, nurses, and counselors, we're looking at a 3% increase. Uh, that cost is about $7.7 .7 million. Um, our administrative education, administrative business, 2.5% uh, increase. That's a cost of about $1.9 million. Um, our paraprofessionals on the administrative and instructional level, a 3.5% raise. Uh, that's about $950,000. In the auxiliary area, we're looking at a 3.5% raise for all our custodians, maintenance workers, food service, et cetera. Um, we're looking at uh, proposing our bus drivers getting a flat $1 uh, increase, which is e equal to a 5% raise on the midpoint. Um, those changes will be $1.5 million. And then we're recommending the police a 5% uh, raise for, for them, plus adding certification pay for the police force. That's programs where they have years of service and they've achieved uh, educational goals. Uh, we, that cost is four hundred one thousand. So totally, yeah, uh, if I can make that point, just on the police pay, uh, we had uh, Chief and Captain Blakelock did a, a very nice job of um, doing a regional wide salary study for police officers um, and really an analysis to how how can we attract the best candidates, but then also retain them. And what we had seen is that we were losing some officers to other uh, agencies, some based on our, our base pay, which is uh, why we need to make a, an adjustment there, but then also certification pay. When they become master officers and, and uh, they've attained more training and more year service, um, other agencies were paying for those certifications and we currently are not. And, and that, that can be somewhat significant. So we were running into the current situation of training, you know, hiring officers, which is a difficult process and it's long. Um, getting folks hired and getting them trained, which costs us quite a bit of money to, to train someone and then losing them to another agency. So uh, in the end, we feel like this is a, a, a smart move, um, which will allow us to, to fill the spots that we have currently. We have vacancies in our police department that um, we struggle to fill and keep filled. And we believe this is a, a move um, that will make our school district safer in the long run. Curtis, I had a question. Yes, sir. Um, and my memory is a little bit foggy, but didn't we a month or two ago, um, did go ahead and vote on a teacher increase for a certain reason. And I, I'm just trying to recall the circumstances of that. Yes, sir. So um, you did approve the teacher hiring schedule um, uh, next so at a board meeting. Yes, a few, a few weeks ago. The reason we you want broccoli and cauliflower or no? The, the reason that we typically we typically um, approve the teacher hiring schedule early is because we we would have had our job fair this past weekend, um, and you know we we like to be able to show. Uh, incoming teachers what the salary will be for next year so we were not able to do that um, we wouldn't have the job fair but we did we did have you all approve that now um, I do want to make make the point that you know we are in a different place right now um, so if you all wanted to make an adjustment to this you could because we've not hired anyone yet under this plan um, but yes you the only for teachers librarians and nurses have you already approved we have not officially approved for any other uh, employees yet in the district. Well, um, going off what you just said, is there, is there any concern about 
about that, um, about, I guess, the unknown why, that we would need to address that or? Um, if we, Darren, if you could go back a slide. Um, the other way, yeah. Um, um, maybe, maybe we can't. Can you go? Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, Darren, I've done a lot of analysis on this. What, we, what we're going to see here um, in a few slides is a not insignificant increase in health insurance premiums. Uh, we believe that's coming. Um, you know, like I said, you had a lot of forethought last year when we when we kept some of the money and we didn't we didn't put it all into last year's raises. And part of that was to uh, make sure that we had money to be able to make adjustments, cost of living adjustments this year because we anticipated there could be health premium increases this year, and we didn't want to get to this point and um, know that we had to make health insurance adjustments and then not be able to adjust someone's salary where people would actually be bringing home less money next year. So um, this recommendation that you see at 3%, we we did recommend, and, we, and that's what we brought forward to you tonight, 2.5%. Uh, there was discussion at the last board meeting about um, doing ed administrative education, administrative business at three. We brought forward two and a half because um, for the most part, those employees at two and a half would, would definitely cover that cost of, of insurance premium and, and the cost of living adjustment um, based on their salary structures. Uh, and then because of those health insurance premiums, you can see three and a half for instructional support auxiliary uh, because, and, and for the bus drivers that 5% because we wanna make sure we cover um, that cost. So because of our, our savings and the way that we've, we've really um, been smart, Darren and I are confident mm -hmm. in this number. And um, we're also confident that if we did have some exposure next year, be it through attendance or um, a lower enrollment, we would be able to make adjustments throughout the year that would save money. Um, so overall, I would tell you, these are all numbers that we're comfortable with in the budget. And it's still conservative and it still leaves us um, some protection. Well, one last question for Darren. And, you know, I don't follow this, but I've always heard through the years that the cost of living, it, you know, 3% is about right. Is that still kind of the accurate number? Yes, sir. It, it, it's been trending right at the uh, 2 to 3% uh, for the past few years. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, and as we just talked, this is our approved 2020-2021 teacher hiring schedule. Um, like we said, it can, is you, I think can you hear me, Darren? Yeah, go go ahead, Skeeter. We can hear you. All right, sorry about that. Just figuring out the mute thing. Hey, talk, talk to me a little bit about the, the bus driver a dollar, 5% increase. Um, it was just a flat dollar. Can you walk me through that, you know, why, why we came up with a dollar? Um, you know, as we had our discussions with TASB, um, you know, one of the things that uh, you get when you look at the bus driver pay scale, as, as some of the bus drivers, you know, a lot of our bus drivers have a lot of years of experience, 15 plus years. And with the raise being on the midpoint, the amount of raise that they get as a percentage of their pay um, is actually less than a bus driver, you know, as a percentage of their pay you know, who's relatively five years or less. So we were trying to make it as equal as we could across the board to maintain the spread or, or, or instead of compressing uh, the pay scale, we were trying to even it out across the whole pay scale through all the years of service. Okay. Thank you. Okay, once again, on our approved teacher hiring schedule, um, general pay increase uh, 3% um, is an $1,800 raise for all returning teachers. Um, it includes adjustments for years 2 through 15 from $150 uh, to $950. Um, and this will have a, a new starting teacher salary of $57,000. So our personnel allocations, now this is, uh, you know, support at the campus level. Um, for 1,500 new students. We have 12th grade at Grand Oaks High School. Uh, we're opening Stockton Junior High School and we're going to full day pre-K. Um, it includes uh, 225 new positions that is made up of 125 teachers, 
five administrators, 16 and a half professionals, and 77.5 paraprofessionals. And this is at a cost of about $11.3 million. Now to support our campuses, uh, this is 72 new positions. The majority of those positions are in our auxiliary departments, that's for custodians, maintenance workers, transportation drivers. Um, that is a cost of about $3.5 million. The total new employees would be right at 297 at a cost of $14.85 million. So now looking at our projected expenditure budget increase, um, as we discussed, this is a summary, uh, additional personnel for growth, um, $14.86 million, our cost of living increase, 12.5 million. Um, we also have an increase to uh, our substitute pay, that's 300,000. Um, we're backing out our, our employee retention stipend. We're not recommending that for this year. And we have uh, budgeted funds that we're transferring in pre-K that we're able to account for. That, that adds up to 9.42 million. Uh, TRS in kind, that's the offset to the revenue side of the $3.5 million. And then other expenses uh, as far as fuel, utilities, insurance, uh, supplies, et cetera, uh, increase of $1.95 million for total expenditures of $23.69 million. <clears throat> so now if we look at our 2020-2021 our, our projected budget, um, our beginning revenue for this year, $555.62 million. Uh, total revenue increase, $24.71 million. For estimated total revenue of $580.33 million. Um, our beginning expenditures, and this is based on, on a minute amount, because last month we did come to the board. Um, we had to amend the budget for $2.75 million for the additional teachers that we hired uh, to help us with the 2,000 uh, students that we had come in. That was, uh, you know, 650 over over our budgeted amount, so we needed some help there. Um, so we have a total estimated expenditure increase of $23.69 million, giving us an estimated total expenditures of $576.02 million, and that leaves us with potential available funds of $4.31 million. So with the budget, um, what's next? Um, we still need to finalize our revenue. Um, working on our state funding because a lot of that uh, is now determined, you know, helps us calculate it with our taxes. We will not receive certified values until July 25th. Um, however, as, I, as I've told y'all last time, we, we talked about the budget. The state will actually calculate our tax compression. And so we'll be working with the state on that calculation. Um, we need to continue to finalize expenditures uh, with the campus and de departmental supply budget needs. As far as budget meetings, public hearings, and budget, budget approval, July 15th, currently we have scheduled the district level planning and decision-making committee. Um, based on the results from that, we'll bring that uh, to the uh, July 21st uh, board for a formal presentation of the budget. Uh, August 4th, we'll have our first public hearing. On August 18th, we'll have a public hearing before the board meeting. And then at that board meeting, we will be asking uh, the board to adopt the budget and the tax rate at that time. So now just kind of uh, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to give uh, y'all a health insurance update. Um, we have been working with United Healthcare on uh, uh, you know, our plan for next year. First thing we need to look at though is our current plan performance. Um, I know y'all seen this, uh, schedule each month. I wanted to update it for March so y'all could see that. Um, as you can see, our total revenues for the year is $28.6 million. Uh, total expenses, uh, $29.1 million. So our revenues are under expenses right now of roughly $500,000. Um, we've had five consecutive months in the red. Um, with the large months coming up, June, July, and August, um, I, I do not see that trend. Um, uh, going away. It, it might even get a little worse moving forward. So we're really watching that. Um, uh, whoop, excuse me, gotta go back. Um, so looking at market trends and what we're trending, uh, you know, with the plan, you know, medical inflation rate is currently trending around five to seven percent. Uh, currently, CISD is trending just above market in the eight to ten percent range. 
And this is basically due to high dollar claims. We've had several high dollar claims. And we've actually had uh, high dollar claim, claims that have penetrated our stop loss in the plan. And then we've just had very high utilization of the plan this year. Um, over the past four years, we've actually outperformed the market. You know, market uh, over the past four years has always been right around that five to seven percent. In the last four years, we've been in the three percent, four percent range. And so our, our employees have, have had, a, had a good run of, of high benefits with low premiums. Um, last year, our employees got no premium increases. We actually offered a plan through the Kelsey program that uh, actually lowered premiums while increasing benefits. Um, so looking at our health plan outlook, this year there will be changes to our plan design. We will have to tighten, um, tighten those benefits. We've been working with uh, United Healthcare, looking at the decremental changes, you know, as we adjust deductibles and everything like that, getting an idea where that will put us financially, and then also what premium increases uh, we will have to do to fund, fund the program. So, uh, you know, that is what really what I wanted to share with y'all on health insurance. Um, we plan on bringing the plan design uh, to the April 21st board meeting. Uh, we have a, a meeting with the Employee Benefits Committee on uh, April 15th to uh, show them our, our plan design changes and, and employee premiums and uh, hopefully get a vote from them uh, to, bring, to bring this to the board on April 21st. And uh, so with that, I'll take any questions on the budget or health insurance. Mr. Rice, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the health insurance benefits, is it possible for us to take a look at the use of drug, the drugs that, uh, that we pay for, and see if there's some changes that could affect lowering our premiums in drugs? If we've got to raise health insurance premiums, I'd sure like to offer a way to help uh, our, our CISD employees with the cost of medications and things like that. And so I do know that there are programs out there where if the primary formulary is uh, generic medications, then there can be sometimes no copay at all for generics or extremely low copays. With what we're seeing with good RX and other things, I think there's opportunities to change premiums that are, I'm sorry, not premiums, copays that are paid for uh, medications. And so I just like us to look at that again. Uh, I, I think there may be some opportunities there to save some dollars. Yes, sir. As, as we're working with United Healthcare, we're looking at all decremental changes that are out there. Uh, not only the benefit changes as far as deductibles, out of pocket costs, et cetera. And pharmacy is definitely a, a, a player in that. And we'll be looking at uh, benefit levels within in the pharmacy and, and what type of uh, options we can offer with generic versus versus name brand uh, uh, pharmaceuticals often. And Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think we had had this conversation. Um, overall, when you look at plan performance, our pharmacy is the area that we really performed fairly well at this year. That, that's, that's been an area of, of, I guess, somewhat of a strength in the program. Yes, sir, you are correct. Our, pharm our pharmacy is, is really performing well. Um, that is not really an area of concern. It is, it is performing well. We, we will make some tweaks just to keep up with market, but the, but the pharmacy has actually been performing well. Okay. We can always look for ways to save more. Absolutely. But any other uh, questions that we could answer for you all on the budget preparation or um, just the healthcare outlook moving forward? Dr. Noel, I have another question. I'm sorry. No. Uh, Mr. Rice mentioned that we access four golden pennies, but there could be an opportunity, I understand, to access a fifth golden penny. Yes, sir, that is correct. And so, that, well, yeah, I, that I is built into, that. yes, sir. So that is built into this plan. It's part of the House Bill 3 process of um, when they provided more funding, you know, to education through House Bill 3. Um, one of the ways that they did that is pro providing us this opportunity to access an additional golden penny. So what a golden penny basically means is um, that penny generates two pennies worth of funding because uh, the state kicks in uh, the, other, the other half of the funding. So 
Uh, it is a mechanism that is used and intended to be used to fund things like full day pre-K, GT, dyslexia services, all, all of the new things that were included in House Bill 3 and these new expectations that were put upon us. So for us, uh, a golden penny, uh, Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, that's $8 million roughly? That is correct. Okay, so that $8 million, you think about pre-K for us is about a $5.5 million endeavor. Uh, and then additionally, the, the other new programs that are now expected, that, that is what will help us cover that cost. And they, they built the system so that we could access that golden penny while also lowering the overall tax rate, which is uh, what you can see there on Darren's presentation, but to be able to, to access and generate more state funding and still offer a lower tax rate to, your, um, you know, to our citizens here in Conroe ISD. Uh, did I cover that, Mr. Sanders? I don't Yes, you did. And that's okay. what I wanted to do. So, so when would we need to vote on accessing the penny? And, and, and I assume it would start for the fall. Yeah, it will be part of the budget approval process so that, you know, in August when we come in and you all officially approve the budget and then you approve the tax rate, it would be, um, it would be included in that, that voting that you would typically do in August. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Williams, did you have a question? Yeah, do we all need to be, I mean, you need 100% um, present there for that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought, right, Darren? Well, not 100% present. We just need 100% vote. Okay. We need 100% we need yay. Okay, so but not 100% quorum. Correct. And so, but just for example, like, you know, we're this budget is built upon that assumption if you, if we were to choose not to access that golden penny, um, that would be an eight million dollar um, reduction from this budget. Um, so that we would, we would then be bringing forward a, a deficit budget at this point uh, without that. Mr. Hubert, I can see you there. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, real quick. I, I'd like to go back to the budget as well. Uh, two things. It looks like it, we're estimating another 1,500 kids, and, and I've heard you talk a couple of times and mentioned that we don't know what enrollment is going to be like, which I think is a fair assessment. Um, but even if we slow enrollment, let's just say we get no increase, that looks like it would affect our budget by about $10 million, since that's what we're kind of looking at for, for new enrollment. Um, so I, in the grand scheme, if, if we're looking at a $4, four million dollar surplus if you will on the budget if we take 10 million out we would be able to we would run it as a, a small deficit of around six million dollars if i read that correctly if at least just per se if we had fifteen thousand less students or slowed the growth down by to zero growth year over year yes sir so my other, if, I, if i can speak to that real fast yes yeah, so um that is part of you know, when you look long term for us, the reason that we want to carry that four million dollars forward, um, first and foremost, is because we know what's going to happen in Austin next time they go. It's going to be ugly, and um, by no fault of of our representat our representatives at all, it's just the, their budget's going to be really tight. So, um, you know, when we can carry money forward like we did from last year to this year, it allows us to um, soften any blow that may come from from what may change in our funding formula. But additionally, um, yes, that 4 million gives us a cushion. If we were to experience fewer enroll enrollees next year, it would give us that cushion. And then we would also, you know, if that happened, you know, we are so big that over time, if we did a hiring freeze at the beginning of the year, you know, we have attrition throughout the year. We have people that retire and move and do different things. We would be able to save a lot of money throughout the year too, if we needed to because of an enrollment um, uh, deficit. So we'd be able to make up, make up the budget as well. Okay. The other question I have on that and, uh, maybe someone else, you know, Ray Dater and somebody else might be able to answer this for me as well. Open up the conversation is what are the thoughts about appraisal values coming up in, uh, in November, um, with the economy being what it is and the COVID virus, and we don't know how long it's going to last. Has there been any conversation and talk about the potential of property values, you know, housing markets, uh, you know, more vacancy being out or appraisal values not being what we're expecting? 
and how that would affect us as well? Yeah, so I think that's a, a, it's a certainly a fair question. I think it's something that we, uh, we certainly pay attention to. Um, we are fairly conservative. You go back to, if you go back to our bond, you know, preparation, we're fairly conservative in our estimated growth. Um, Darren, if, um, if you, you know, you can see the chart, or can you go back to our um, appraised value growth, Darren, over time? There you go. So you can see over time, even in you know times of recession, just because they, they continue to build houses and people continue to move here, um, you know, on the low end, you can see over over um, you know the last ten years is about three and a half percent. So this year, you know, we, we've already had conversations, so we anticipate about five and a half percent. I think it's a fair concern, Mr. Hubert, to think about what what next year could hold. Um, you know, it may be three and a half percent, um, you know, or, or who knows what it could be. It's certainly not going to be 10 or 12 as we've had in some of the bigger years, but, um, we are confident. We, you know, we have looked at, um, just to remind you, as Darren mentioned earlier, three on, on the M and O side, which is our annual budget. And Darren, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on the M and O side. Um, if it's three and a half or six and a half, it, it doesn't it doesn't change anything on our M and O side. That, that all that extra money just goes to the state. It doesn't come to us. So anything over two and a half um, is goes to the state. So it wouldn't change anything for us. Um, two and a half equals six and a half on the M and O side, which is the you know significantly large portion of our budget. the The place where it would make a difference would be on the bond and indebtedness side, um, you know, if we didn't have the growth we anticipated, the positive on that side of the house is we also didn't anticipate interest rates being what they are today. So we are getting um, significantly better interest rates, either through refundings or even as we're selling new bonds um, that will allow us to maintain our current uh, tax rate on that side of the house, even if we see a slight decrease in um, our property value escalation over the coming years. But we have analyzed that to make sure that, you know, if we needed to slow down some of our construction in the future, sell less bonds, we've had those conversations. Part of that reality is rates are so low right now that you, you uh, it really wouldn't benefit us long-term to not take advantage uh, and follow our normal schedule and not take advantage of those lower rates. Um, because if we waited a year and rates went up, it would actually cost us more money in the long run. Did I, did I cover that for you, Mr. Hubert? Any, anything else I can try to clarify? No, that, that hit it. You guys have already, of course, two steps ahead of me. I was just making sure that we at least talked about it. I wanted to hear what y'all had to say, so thank you. Yes, sir, appreciate the question. Anyone else uh, have any questions that we can answer for you? Okay, well, seeing none, um, that is our uh, final agenda item for the evening. Um, we appreciate this process. I think we've learned a little bit along the way here. We will, um, once again, this will be our format that we will follow for our um, regularly scheduled uh, board meeting that's two weeks from tonight. And we'll, we'll need to make some adjustments. And as once again, I'll work with President Williams on uh, just the some of the formatting of how will we um, how will we handle you know uh, voting and things like that and, and uh, Miss Blakelock's done a wonderful job of setting up this webinar and what the the difference here in webinar versus uh, your normal Zoom meeting you may have heard concerns about some security uh, with Zoom over time and this is a little more of a secure network and this will allow us to move people in and out so for example next or uh, two weeks from now when we are naming uh, people into new positions new principals uh, miss blakelock will be able to add them here to our meeting and, and allow them to address you and then um, then they'll kind of slide right back out of the meeting so uh, we're seeing the forward facing side of the meeting here and miss blakelock is seeing the full picture and she can kind of move people in and out as they need to engage with you so um, just know that that even though you see just who you see in the room, if you have questions for other people um, that would that are typically in the room, they are still present, and we we're always.
always here to answer questions for you um, that we that you may have. Um, if there are no further questions, I'm looking to see. I don't see anybody. So we will go ahead and adjourn here at 7.30. We appreciate you all being online. Please be safe, social distancing, wear a mask if you go out and uh, we will be back uh, and see you all in a few weeks. Thank you.